I invite you to take your Bible and go with me, please, to the book of 1 Samuel. The book of 1 Samuel, we're going to the 20th chapter of 1 Samuel together this morning. 1 Samuel chapter number 20. As you're turning there, let me just mention an opportunity we're going to have for anyone who would like to avail themselves of it. Next Saturday, August the 27th, next Saturday, August the 27th at 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to meet right out in the lobby for a session of Discover Beacon. It's our first time ever we've done this together on a Saturday morning. It is designed for folks who new members, folks who are wanting to know more about our church. It's going to be an opportunity where Sharon and I will be able to spend uh, some time together with you. And uh, I'm going to be teaching about who we are and what we believe and why we believe it, how we operate, what we understand the mission of God to be for our church. It's going to be a wonderful time together. It'll start at nine o'clock that morning. We'll have a little light refreshment uh, before, and uh, then we're going to eat lunch together and we're going to provide child care. And so if uh, you have an interest in that, we'd love for you to come and be a part of that. You can register a couple of ways. You can go on our website, beaconbaptist.org slash register. Or the easiest way is just take your phone out and uh, text our church text number, 919-809-5558. Text the word discover. And when you text the word discover, uh, it'll allow you to share information with us about you and your name and if you need child care and how old your children are, those kind of things. And I so surely hope that you will avail yourself of that opportunity. That'll happen next Saturday, August the 27th. Well, you found 1 Samuel chapter 20. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand for the reading of God's word. We've been looking at this man's life, David, looking at it under the thought, David, a man after God's own heart, which is a compliment that I didn't create, but God paid him even before he was king and then hundreds of years after he lived and died. And we're in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel this morning. And verse number one says, And David fled from Naoth in Ramah. That's where we saw him last at the end of chapter 19. We'll come back and talk about it in a moment. And came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is mine iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? I don't know about you, but I can almost sense panic in his voice, can't you? Verse 2, and he said unto him, God forbid, thou shalt not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, but that he will show it me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. And David swore moreover and said, thy father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in thine eyes. And he saith, let not Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, there is but a step between me and death. Then said Jonathan unto David, whatsoever thy soul desireth, I will even do it for thee. And David said unto Jonathan, behold, Tomorrow is a new moon, and I should not fail to sit with the king at meat, but let me go, that I may hide myself in the field unto the third day at even. If thy father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all of his family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he be very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore, thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. Notwithstanding, if there be iniquity, slay me thyself, for why shouldest thou bring me to thy father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from thee, for if I knew certainly that evil were determined by my father to come upon thee, then would not I tell it thee. Then said David to Jonathan, who shall tell me? Or what if thy father answer thee roughly? Jonathan said to David, come and let us go out into the field. And they went out, both of them, into the field. 
Jonathan said to David, O Lord God of Israel, when I have sounded my father about tomorrow, any time, or the third day, and behold, if there be good toward David, and I then send not unto thee, and show it thee, the Lord do so, and much more, to Jonathan. But if it please my father to do evil, then I will show it thee, and send thee away. Thou mayest go in peace. And the Lord be with thee, as he had been with my father. And thou shalt not only while yet I live show me the kindness of the Lord, that I die not, but also thou shalt not cut off thy kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Let the Lord even require the hand of David's enemies, and Jonathan calls David to swear again because he loved him. For he loved him as his own soul. If you've been with us as we've journeyed through David's life, you know that God has already knit the hearts of Jonathan and David together. We saw it back in the 18th chapter. And yet we see it put to the test here. And I pray this morning God will use his word in our lives. Would you join me in that prayer? Would you please? Our Father, we are grateful today for the Bible, the Holy Word of God. We're thankful for the life of this man, David. Lord, what a man that he would be sensitive and submissive to you. And yet today we see him, I think, react in fear. Lord, all of us have faced or are facing situations that would cause fear to crowd out faith in our lives. Would you give us encouragement and strength from the scriptures today? All of us have faced opportunities where we could be a friend to someone. Would you help us today to understand the value of such? All of us today need a friend that will never leave us nor forsake us. And you are that friend. And I pray if there's someone in this auditorium or watching with us online that knows not Christ as Savior, I pray today they'd believe on him. In his name, I ask all these things and for his sake. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Let me just remind us this morning as we return to this study of the point we are in our text in David's life. It's very evident all the way back in chapter 13 of 1 Samuel, that God has rejected Saul as being the king of Israel. He not only spoke that in chapter 13, he spoke that again in chapter 15. He did so because Saul was an impatient, arrogant, proud man. Can I just tell you that there is an eternal principle in the scriptures. God resisteth the proud but giveth grace to the humble. That, that word resisteth there in the New Testament means to hold off at arm's distance. God holds us off when we follow our own pride. I know this morning is one of God's children my desire is never to be held away from God. My desire is to be drawn close to God. James said, you draw near to God, he'll draw near to you. But God resists the, the proud. God's resisted Saul. God's told Saul he'll no longer be the king. That he will search and find a man after his own heart. And we've defined that phrase as being sensitive and submissive to God's heart. That's where David lived his life. David lived his life in a position of sensitivity and submission to God. But let me say to all of us, that doesn't mean that there was never a time when David wasn't sensitive and submissive. As a matter of fact, I honestly believe that there is such a record here. I believe that David is fleeing because of fear. And I could go into a great discourse on it. I will not. 
bore you with all the facts. If you want to discuss it sometime, I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you about it. But I, I do believe that David left a place of safety. If you know anything about where he was in chapter 19, he was in Naoth in Ramah. Ramah is where the most spiritual man at that point in history is probably living. His name is Samuel. He's the prophet of God. He is there training preacher boys. We talked about that the last time we were in 1 Samuel. Naoth is a place of dwelling, I believe, for the school of the prophets. God protected David in a miraculous way. If you remember there in the closing seven or eight verses of chapter 19, Saul sent three companies of soldiers and then finally went himself to capture David. But each time God overwhelmed them with his own spirit. I think what we see here in chapter 20 of 1 Samuel just reminds us that David's a person of flesh like you and me. You know, sometimes we take people like those people the ensemble just sang about. We take those people and we lift them up to a plane like, man, they must have walked on air. <laughs> no, no, no. We're all made of the same clay. We all have the same sinful nature. We, we all are prone to wonder, as the songwriter said it. We, we're all prone to fear. It, it, the honest truth this morning, it, it, if we wanted to, every one of us in this room could go home, lock ourselves in our house, and never come out again. Because we don't know what's going to get us. We, we don't know what's happening, going to happen. We know people who have done that. <laughs> David was a man subject to like passions as we are, James said of Elijah. Saul's extremely jealous. We know in chapter 18 and chapter 19, at least on three occasions, Saul has sought to kill David already face to face by throwing a javelin at him. And yet in the midst of all that turmoil, God knit David and Jonathan together. Would you go back to the 18th chapter just a moment? Because this is a foundation of what we're going to see today. Look back at chapter 18 and verse 1, would you please? It says in chapter 18 and verse 1, It came to pass when he'd made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan, that's Saul's son, that's the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. The, the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And when we looked at that passage of Scripture together, we talked about how that the spiritual relationship between them was the platform for their friendship. Verse 2 says, and Saul took him that day and would not let him go no more to his father's house. Talking about David. He loved David and appreciated David. David's, back in chapter 16, been a harpist for him, become his armor bearer, has now slain Goliath. Verse 3 says of chapter 18, then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. We talked about them. Basis of that covenant, talking about the dividing of the animals and the passing through in the figure eight and the, the permanency of that covenant. Jonathan even shows his appreciation for David in verse four by stripping himself of the robe that was upon him. That would be some kind of a kingly robe, the princely robe, and gave it to David, his garments, even to his sword, to his bow, to his girdle. We get over here to chapter 20, if you will, please. Verse number eight, there in the midst of that verse, it says, For thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee. <laughs> David said, I just want to remind you that we have a covenant. We'll get to verse 16. We'll get there in a little bit. But it says, John the made a covenant with the house of David. I think the key word in the whole chapter is that, that word covenant, where they had, they had sworn to each other mutual love, respect, and care. If you've journeyed with us, you know David has already had to flee on a couple of occasions. But in spite of Saul wanting to kill David, 
in spite of his life being under threat by the king, he continued to serve the king valiantly as a soldier. E even when the tension increased, he slipped in to help Saul. I'm not sure all of Saul's problems. I, I believe he has some mental instability. I believe he had emotional instability. But, but I believe the root cause of it all for Saul, and I don't think this for everybody, but for Saul, the root cause was the spirit of the Lord had departed from him. And an evil spirit that the Lord has permitted has come upon him. And Saul has decided to succumb to that evil spirit. Yet through it all, Jonathan and David remain faithful and true friends. Now, please understand, Jonathan's the heir apparent. You, you would expect him to want to rid himself of David as much as Jonathan, as Saul wanted to rid himself of David. And they're not teenage friends, okay? I brought that up a few weeks ago. Jonathan is probably 20 to 30 years David's senior. Jonathan has been a successful warrior in the army of Israel. If you go to the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, uh, Jonathan and his armor bearer got, overcame the Philistines in a battle by themselves. They killed 20 as if it were in a half an acre. They're not two little chummy friends walking around. Hey, I like you. You like me. You like, we like each other. Yeah, we do. <laughs> and as chapter 20 opens, I believe David's quite fearful. <laughs> Can I just say to you, so you don't think I'm going to jump all over David's case here. With great understanding he's fearful okay he, he's not he's not imagining that javelin coming at him he's seen it three times so some of the fears we have have absolute reason and, and if you've never dealt with any fear you pray for us who have okay you just, just pray for us. We need it. You probably need the practice. But anyway, you pray for us. And David, though he's sensitive and submissive to God, I think he responds wrongly. I believe the place of protection was in Naoth in Ramah. But it's interesting this is what I believe the bottom line of chapter 20 is. David's not fleeing from Saul. David's fleeing to Jonathan. I, I think it may have been the fear of Saul that motivated him and propelled him. But I believe it's the love of Jonathan and for Jonathan that allowed him to make his way to Gibeah or somewhere right outside of Gibeah and, and met with Jonathan. So this morning, I want us to look at David under this thought. Fearful, but faithful. If you and I, if God didn't expect us to deal with fear, he would not have said so many times in the Bible, fear not. It may be the most oft-repeated command of God. Fear not. Well, why would he say fear not? He would only say fear not because he knows that we're prone to fear. Back when COVID first hit, you remember that? About 10,000 years ago. Seems like it, doesn't it? You remember the fear that gripped our country? 
I, I, I felt so overwhelmed by it. I even preached a series of messages on fear. All of us know fear. But can I say to us that the greatest power against our fear is our faith. Your greatest power against your fear is not you. My greatest power against my fear is not me. My greatest power and your greatest power against my fear is my faith in the God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Isaiah says in chapter 41, fear thou not for I am with thee. Hey, listen to me. If God be for us, Paul said, who can be against us? You say, I got a whole line of them, pastor. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. Two aspects of this account I want you to see this morning as we think about this man fearful but faithful. Number one, the cause of the fear. David is convinced. <laughs> I would be too. <laughs> Ooh, I see myself so much in David here. I... Uh, I could probably write this as a testimony. He's convinced Saul's going to kill him. I mean, look at what he does when he finds Jonathan there in verse 1. He says, what have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before thy father that he seeketh my life? I'm, I'm telling you, David, David said, I, I, I can't understand for the life of me, Jonathan, why he wants to rid me of himself. Rid himself of me. He was certain. He was confident that his father was going to kill him. I love the confidence of Jonathan, though. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that when you're down in the valley, if you've got a real friend, he can stand up on the mountain and give a helping hand to you? Look at those first two words. Just read those first two words that Jonathan speaks there in verse number, number two. It says, and he said to him, here's the next two words. Read it right out loud with me. You ready? God forbid. He said, David, daddy's got a problem. He's got to get through God to get to you. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to tell you right there. Whew, I think, boy, thank you, Lord. I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad ain't nobody going to get to me that God don't let in. God forbid. He said, no, David. Daddy's not going to get to you because our heavenly daddy's the one in charge. Now, I think he's a little naive. He goes on to say, he, he does say, thou shalt not die. But then he goes on to say, my father's going to do nothing unless he tells me. And, and I think part of the reason is because he did tell him back in chapter 19. But David refutes that argument. You remember now, I think he's filled with fear at this point. He, he said, verse 3, thy father knoweth certainly I have found grace in thy sight. And he said, let not John know this lest he be grieved. And then he does state that truth I've already mentioned earlier in the service this, evening, this morning. There is but a step between me and death. See, when you and I are filled with fear instead of filled with faith, we always see the worst case scenario. Now, now please understand, David had every right. Three times a javelin has been thrown at him. He's been that. He, I don't know. I, you, you, think, you think Saul missed him by a yard or an inch? I personally think it's probably a very close call. But, but, but when you and I are filled with fear instead of faith, we, we always see the worst case scenario. And listen to me. That's where every one of our human nature and human minds going to take us to. The reality is David's going to live 30 plus years after he makes this statement. 
But in the statement, there is truth. Because every one of us this morning are just one heartbeat. Away from death. I don't know when I'm going to die and you don't know when you're going to die. But that heart quits beating. We're gone. You know what that says to us? That, that says to every one of us this morning, we better be prepared to die. You better be prepared to die, friend. I better be prepared to die. You say, Pastor, how can you make preparation? There's only one way to make preparation. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. There's only one way to be ready to die. That's by knowing Christ as your Savior. You sit here this morning in this auditorium, and you're with us online, and you don't know Christ as your Savior. Let me just say to you today, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there is but a step between you and death. I don't know when that step will happen, but that step will happen for every one of us. All of us are one heartbeat from eternity. So Jonathan, I think, finally got the seriousness of the matter. Verse 40, he said, whatever thy soul desire, thou will do it even to thee. Isn't it interesting how often the soul is mentioned here? And I'm, I just want to emphasize it. This was a spiritual friendship. This was a relationship that was based on their relationship with God. You know, I'm glad, I'm glad today that as Christians, you and I have a brotherhood and a sisterhood that's even thicker than blood. So David says, well, I've got a little idea here, Jonathan. Let me share it with you. He said, tomorrow's the new moon, and you know, your daddy always has this feast, and I'm going to go hide, and if your daddy <laughs> asks about me, now this ain't right, and please don't, don't think God glosses over this, but I want you to lie to your daddy about me. I, I, you know, that hurts my feelings. But hey, listen to me. When, you, when you're filled with fear, you'll do anything to justify Whatever it is in your mind. God doesn't, God doesn't condone this. God, but God does expose it. Isn't that interesting? If, if you and I are right in David's life, we probably wouldn't even mention it. We'd probably just go on. He said, but tell him I'm going down to be with my family at a feast. And if it's well, everything's okay. But if he's angry, then he's going he's gonna to kill me. He's going to take my life. They make their way to a field. I can't prove this to you, but I want to think it's the same field David had hid in before in chapter 19, verses 1, 2, and 3. Jonathan promises to protect David no matter what. But I want you to notice how Jonathan, as he begins to talk there in verse 12, how often he speaks of the Lord. Look at verse 12. He said, David, O Lord God of Israel. Verse 13, the Lord do so and much more to Jonathan. Look at the end of verse 13. The Lord be with thee as he had been my father. Verse number 14, show me the kindness of the Lord. Verse 15, when the Lord hath cut off the enemies of David, every one from the face of the earth. At this point, at this point, at least it seems to me, Jonathan has more confidence in the Lord than David does. This man after God's own heart, this man sensitive, submissive to God, this man who would eventually be the king of Israel, he, he's filled with fear. But he's got a faithful friend. And he says, when you become the king, look at it there, verse 14. Not only will you show me while you, I live the kindness of the Lord, but, but after verse 15, after I'm dead, don't cut my family off from the kindness of the Lord. 
be a while before we get to it, but eventually we're going we're gonna to see David perform that. 2 Samuel chapter 9, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan had one boy by the name of Mephibosheth who was crippled in both his feet that David brought to the king's house and set him at the king's table. So Jonathan laid out the plan. Here's how I'm going to communicate to you, verse 18. Tomorrow is the new moon. You're going to be missed. And I'm going to let you know this. If everything's well, I'm going to go out in this field and I'm going to shoot the arrows and I'm going to tell the boy, oh, those arrows on my side. And if I shoot the arrows and they're beyond. I'm going to say to the boy, oh, they're, they're beyond you, son. They're beyond you. He said, now if they're on this side, verse 21, you, you take them and come. And there's peace, no hurt. But they're beyond. Look at what he says in verse 22. Over and over again, it is, the Lord has sent thee away. The Lord has sent thee away. It's interesting where he tells David to hide. I want you to see it. We'll move on here. He tells him to hide by the stone Ezel. It's at the end of verse number 19. The, the word Ezel means to show the way. Now, I can't prove this to you, but I believe Ezel was a road marker on the road that was directional. Okay? I think Ezel, if you and I had been living in that day, would have known where the Ezel was outside of Gibeah that told you go this way, you remember, and go that way, and you'll be there, here, yon, wherever you're going. We, we, we used to depend on directional signs. Now we have women that just speak to us on our phone and tell us which way to go. Turn right, turn left, take the next right, go to the next light. It, it means to show the way. I think it has spiritual significance in the life of David. He's saying, David, God's going to show you the way. You know, I, I'm glad that God doesn't just show the way. I'm glad God goes the way. I'm glad when God shows us his way through his word and by his spirit that, that he promises that he'll never leave us and forsake us, that he'll go with us even to the end of the age, into the world. Even when it's a path we don't want to trod. I'm glad God goes with us. David's fixing a travel path that no one would ever choose. For the next 10 years, he's going to be a fugitive on the run. He who's been anointed the king of Israel He's going to be hiding in caves and dens. He's going to the land of the Philistines and the enemies of God to try to survive. We'll see it all. But you know what Jonathan told him before he ever left? God's going to show you the way. I wonder this morning, when you examine your life, are you going the way God's shown you to go? Or are you just doing your own thing? I'm, I'm going to just say this and say it very clearly and plainly, and I don't mean to anger you. But the reality is when we go our way, we have no promise that God will protect us. But when we go his way, we have every promise that God will go with us and provide So we, we've seen the cause of the fear. Secondly, I want you to see the confirmation of the fear. Verse 24, isn't this interesting? We won't spend any time on it, but it's an interesting statement. So David hid himself in the field. Here he is. He's the king of Israel. 
a fake is sitting on the throne and he's hiding in the field. Can, can I just say to you that when things don't go the way you think they ought to go, the last thing you and I ought to do is forget God, turn our back on God. Because I promise you, God knows where you're at. God knew right where David was in the field. You, you can't get out of the, away from the all-seeing eye of God this morning. He sees you. He knows you. Job says, he knoweth the way that I take. When I'm tried, I shall come forth as gold. David's in the field there. Jonathan's sitting at the king's table, eating the king's meat. Day one happens. He doesn't show up. Isn't it interesting, though, where Saul is? Oh, man, what a telltale sign verse 25 is. Look at verse 25 with me. The king sat upon his seat at other times, even upon a seat. Where? By the wall. You, 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 where I think, you know where I think Saul's sitting? Saul's sitting right up next to the wall. He's paranoid. He's afraid somebody's going to kill him. Because when you, have, when you have murder in your heart, you think everybody else has got murder in their heart. He's sitting against the wall. What else does it say there? I think it's verse 25. Who's sitting next to him? Somebody just yell it out. Who's sitting next to him? Abner. Who's Abner? Abner's the general of the army. I can't prove this, but I think Abner's in full military gear. Here's, here's Saul, the king of Israel, sitting up against the wall, looking around, paranoid, thinking somebody's going to kill him, but to think, well, maybe if they try, oh, Abner, get them first. You, you know, the devil delights in getting us to think the way he wants us to think. And Saul, though the king of Israel, is captured by his own thoughts. You, you know the wise man Solomon said? The wise man Solomon said, as a man thinketh in his heart. Anybody know the rest of that verse? So is he. So is he. He's sitting against the wall in the palace thinking... Everybody else operates like I operate. The first day, he just excused it. Maybe David's unclean. The second day, though, he asked Jonathan, verse 27, Wherefore cometh not the son of Jesse to meet? He wouldn't even call David by name, isn't it? Neither yesterday nor today. And Jonathan, contrary to what he should have done, repeats the lie. Look at verse 30. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan. Now listen to this. He's talking to his firstborn son. Thou son of the perverse, rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and in the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse liveth upon the ground, thou shalt not be established in thy kingdom. Wherefore thou... <coughs> <laughs> now send and fetch him unto me, for he shall surely die. You know where anger usually shows itself first? In your words. He speaks ill not only of his son, he speaks ill of his wife. You know who your words usually hurt the most? Those closest to you. Sir, if you're an angry man and you don't submit that anger to the Lord, you're going to hurt the people that are closest to you and one day you're going to wake up and they're not going to be there. Maybe your wife, it may be your children. Ma'am, if you're an angry person and you won't submit that to the Lord, 
You're going to wake up one day and they're not going to be there. Every one of us in this room today have been hurt and harmed by people's anger. You know what the wise man's psalm said? The wise man's psalm says life and death are in the power of the tongue. But if that wasn't enough, Jonathan just asked one, two simple questions. Wherefore, verse 32, wherefore shall he be slain? What hath he done? And look at verse 33, Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him. If words aren't sharp enough arrows, you'll take something else and use it against your family, your friends. If anger rules in your heart. Why? This is why I believe Saul does all of this. He wanted Jonathan to join him in his rebellion against God's will, and Jonathan didn't. He wanted Jonathan to succumb to his own anger, his dad's anger, and join in getting rid of David, whom Jonathan and Saul both know by now is to be the next king of Israel. Can I tell you, parents, listen to me, listen to me well. You don't live in a vacuum by yourself. Your children are watching you. Saul wanted Jonathan to be like him. Jonathan's convinced now. Daddy's going to kill him. He, he leaves. Verse 35, he says, he went out to the field at the time appointed. Took the little lad with him. He said to the little lad, I want you to go and find the arrows I'm going to shoot. He shot, he shot beyond him. He yells out, the end of verse 37, is not the arrow beyond thee? And David, I mean Jonathan, verse 38, cried after the lad. But I don't think he's talking to the lad. I think he's talking to David. Make speed. Haste. Stay not. With a broken heart. Jonathan says to David, make speed, haste, stay not. The little boy brings back his arrows. He gives him his artillery. Verse 40 says, says go back, carry him in the field. Look at verse 41. What a meeting this must have been. David comes out of hiding. He kneels before Jonathan three times. You say, why did he do that? Because he had respect for Jonathan, even though he knew he'd already been anointed king. He knew Jonathan was the son of the king. You see, see genuine, genuine friendship doesn't just love others. Genuine friendship respects others. A lot of stuff has been sold out under the name of love that love didn't have anything to do with it. Because love is always coupled with respect. I've told many a couple in, in my office talking about marriage. I've told many a couple there's, there's a three-legged stool that every marriage stands on, love, trust, and respect. They travel together. David has great respect for Jonathan, but David had great love for Jonathan. Notice there in the middle of verse 41, they kiss one another and wept one with another and to David exceeded. To David was just, could weep no more. 
Their culture was a culture of great emotional expression. They embrace, they weep together. As much as they know, they may never see each other again. Now, you and I, because we live so many hundreds of years later, know that in chapter 23, they're going to meet one more time. And then 10 years later, Jonathan is going to be killed. But they didn't know if they'd ever see each other again. These whom God had knit their soul together, these who loved the Lord and loved each other and respected each other, But I want you to notice how Jonathan leaves David. We hear nothing from David, though I'm sure he spoke. But notice what Jonathan says, verse 42. He says, go in peace. How can you have peace in the midst of turmoil? It's when faith exceeds your fear. He says, go in peace. For as much as we've sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord be between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed forever. And he arose and departed. And Jonathan went into the city. This chapter is a significant turning point in David's relationship not only with Saul but with Jonathan. I I said earlier, I believe the key word we've already seen a couple times, verse 8, verse 16, is covenant. Their friendship survived. Why? Because they were coveted together they were committed to the Lord they were committed to each other and no matter no matter what they encountered no matter what they would endure they would be a real friend can I just challenge you this morning to be a real friend. You, you, you know what the Bible says? The Bible said a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. We, we, have such a, we have such a backward view of friendship in, in the Western Hemisphere and particularly in America. And, and I'll even get a little closer to us, particularly in church. We're all about you being my friend. God's all about me being your friend. What does a friend do? Uh, uh, let, me just, let me just give you two or three things. I'm going to be through. Number one, a friend will challenge you to live all out for God. A friend doesn't draw you away from the Lord. A friend draws you to the Lord. A friend doesn't say, hey, let's miss church tonight. Go to the ball game. or Let's... Let's not do, no, no, a friend draws you to the Lord. A a friend challenges you to draw closer to the Lord. Let me tell you what else a friend does. A a friend affirms your value to them no matter what's going on. It's easy to be the friend in the best of times. It's challenging to be a friend in the worst of times. You're just like me. You've had people you thought were your friend, and today they wouldn't spit on you if you were on fire. Listen to me. A a friend affirms your value no matter what's going on. I'll tell you what else a friend does. A friend is there to encourage you in the difficult hour. I believe one of the best descriptions found in all the Bible 
of the best friend you can have is Jesus. It's Proverbs 18, 24. Where the wise man said, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Now, I think you can have that in a horizontal relationship with other believers because it's based on the Lord Jesus. But I'm so glad this morning that I know him who sticketh closer than a brother. I'm glad he said, I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. And because of that vertical friendship with the Lord God of heaven this morning, God has allowed me to have those horizontal fellowship, friendship with people right here on this planet, people right here in this place today. Yeah, chapter 20 opens. He's fearful. But when he walks out of verse 42, guess what? David's still faithful. He wrote these words. I think when he was a young man, though I can't prove that to you, I think when he was keeping his father's sheep out on the Judean hillside, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest me a table, presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What? A friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not care. Everything to God in prayer. You may find yourself fearful today. But may I encourage you, find yourself faithful.